Hello coders, good afternoon, good evening. It is episode 152 of the How to Code Well podcast. I'm live as I always am Thursday evenings around 8 o'clock. It is Thursday the 31st of March and because we're sort of waving goodbye to March, I'm going to be talking about a different topic um, uh, for, for, for April and that topic is going to be testing. It's going to be testing. We all know my love for testing. And we're going to start by talking about how I am going to, or how I am testing howtocodewell.net. Um, I haven't really mentioned the 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 new things of howtocodewell.net, the things that I've been uh, doing live on Twitch, and the things that I've been doing at silly times of the evenings um, for a while. So I thought I would give you a insight as to all the things that are going on under the hood and how I'm testing those things. Before we do that, though, let's get into the change log. Um, so this is where I talk about things that have happened in the last week. We have, uh, well, yesterday, in fact, I was speaking at PHP Oxford and I was giving my uh, uh, code with confidence using PHP stand talk. And that was really good. I enjoyed that. Uh, I've spoken there before in person. Last night was a virtual one. So that was pretty good. I've Blah, 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 blah. Using, use the words, Pete. You can tell this is live. I have given that talk a couple of times, well, four times already this year, um, which has, uh, which is something that I, <laughs> I've just, I've just wanted to do. Uh, last year, COVID pandemic, didn't really want to talk to anyone, to be honest. Uh, so <laughs> let alone, let alone a group full of people talking about um, PHP. So um, I have just gone all out and I've asked various user groups if they want speakers and a lot of them have said yes and I am speaking as much as I possibly can time uh, given, you know, time permitting. We we have, as I've mentioned before, we have our, our new English Springer Spaniel, which is, well, he is a handful of a big handful so there's a lot of um puppy training involved sort of every day lots of early mornings late nights uh broken sleep so i'm doing all of these things uh, and the building how to code well.net and working my normal contract job whilst uh bringing up a puppy <laughs> which is fun which is fun it'll all be worth it i keep telling myself that it'll all be fine it'll all be fine what I did on Tuesday night was on the YouTubes here. I did a, a stream regarding episode, uh, lesson number nine of the PHP logging course that we are building. Is it, this has taken me uh, I, longer than I had thought, but I'm going to use the excuse of Goose, um, the, the Spaniel. I wanted to get all this done before. Uh, before the new year to be honest with you so we're, we're three months and I haven't actually done any recording um, <laughs> so there's 10 there's 10 videos that I need to somehow record and those videos will be the tutorials there's 10 tutorials in this course and what we've been doing is of course we've been going through the documentation of the course and rebuilding the course or the project in WSL on Parallels, and I've been doing that here on, on YouTube. So the next one is going to be the last one, which is pretty cool. It's all about header redirection in PHP and uh, lo logging out, essentially, of the system. So we've built the system where you can log in, you can get to a secure area, and you can only get to that area if you have a spe specific session value. So it teaches you how to use PHP sessions. So next week is the final one, and what I'm going to do after that is I will probably do, I'm calling these passes. So the first pass was to build the course. The second pass is to go through the documentation of the course and rebuild the project using Windows, so a different platform, and, be, uh, and, and fill out any gaps. What I'm going to do next is offline, so this won't be on a stream. I am going to then rebuild this on a different platform, probably um, probably a, a, a Debian-based thing, I, I would imagine. 
Although, to be honest, that was what we were doing with WSL2, so I don't know if I'm going to gain much. But what I want to do, at least, is to do another another pass. It's like proofreading the documentation. I, I, I essentially want this project to, because this is the first, my first ever paid course that How to Code Well has done for How to Code Well. I've done courses before for, for uh, publication companies like Pact and Manning, but this one is f for my own sake. So I want to make sure that this is uh, as, as good as it possibly can do in the first uh, release. And obviously, because this is a paid thing, there'll be um, updates to this. So I want to make sure that we hit the ground running with this so it's, it's as good as it possibly can do. That's why I would like to do a third pass, and I'll do this offline, where I rebuild the, court, the project from scratch using the documentation, basically copying and pasting from the documentation uh, and, and going through... Uh, the, the the tutorials making sure that everything makes sense and then what I'm going to do is use that documentation almost like a kind of like a script when I'm actually doing a the videos I, I won't be saying things word from word because it'll make me sound like a robot um, but it will certainly be my guiding no notes when I actually come to do the video recording and obviously, when you download the course, you'll also get the project files, which will have the documentation in there, too. So that's that. Um, so next week, we're going to get to lesson 10. That'll be the final one. And then perhaps, you know, optimistically thinking that we're going to finish that next week, I'm going to move on to another course, which means that we have this one course that I've completed and it's going through a third pass internally here so offline um, and I'll just do that one weekend I think I can probably just do that in one hit to be honest and then and then I've got another course lined up that we're going to be doing and we'll start that from um, how we essentially started the the uh, this PHP login course we'll be going through building the documentation I have a on my github profile I have a repository which is like a template of of uh, how to spin up a project so we'll be using that and yes i will be talking more about that um next week in the next in the next podcast what that what that course will be but that's um that'll be interesting that'll be fun okay so uh in terms of how to go well the things that i've been doing recently um i've been doing a lot of testing and you probably be aware of that when you watch the streams on 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 the weekends there is a lot of testing going on this is because we've kind of got to the point where most of the features are in, sort of. There are a few edges that need to be uh, shaped. So I would say I, I'm about 75% there. And we're doing a lot of testing at the moment minute to make sure that the, the stuff that's already in, in play works. Hey, Sim, thank you for joining. Thank you very much for uh, coming on board. So the, the platform, when I say howtocodewell.net, anybody can get to howtocodewell.net and, and see a site. And that site is a static site built in Gatsby. It's, you know, a React thing. And that just has, a, it's very bare bones. It, it, it has essentially the a course page and you can click on the course page and you see the courses and you click on a course and it'll take you to the playlist on YouTube. What I'm actually have been building for the last God knows how many years is actually a platform that people can uh, log into, enroll in courses and actually watch through the website, um, the actual tutorials. And this is also going to be where this paid course is going to be in the future paid courses as well. So you'll be able to watch those, those, um, those videos and you'll be able to follow on with the documentation and um, you'll be able to download the project files and all of that jazz. That's the, essentially the, the whole point, really, of this platform is, is, is to, dare I say, move away from YouTube in the sense of that is the, my single distribution network. I want to be able to post videos to other platforms and then use my howtocodewell.net platform to pull in those, that content. Um, whether that content is going to be on Vimeo or um, Rumble or YouTube, but essentially it's going to be my platform, my my thing. Hey Bernard, thank you for joining. 
hope everybody's doing well today. It's um, It was snowing today for probably about 10 minutes, <laughs> maybe half an hour, and then it stopped snowing today. Uh, but it's very, very cold out there. It's very cold here in the UK at the minute. <laughs> so um, what we're going to talk about today is around the... Um, around the testing side of how to code well and how we're actually going to test the features that we currently have in play and how we're actually going to deal with the, the new features coming on. And I think the best thing to do is to actually talk about... Um, oh, one other thing I should say before we get into that, and I just noticed on the changelog, I've totally forgotten. Um, I am also giving a talk to uh, a, a German user group in about four weeks' time. So I will post those links out uh, if anybody wants to join. It's The talk is going to be on uh, PHP Stan again, so coding with confidence using PHP Stan. And that's going to be at uh, PHP UG, which is user group GMRN. So that's a German uh, user group, West Germany. So that'll be fun. That's going to be in four weeks' time. Again, that's going to be an another remote uh, talk. Anyway, getting back to the original part point of, of this show about testing, what I'm going to do is talk about the features of House Code Well and then how we're going to attempt to test those things. So what I did the other week was I created a functional, well, I don't know if this is the right word for it, but I, I've used the term functional, docu uh, functional definition, so like a, a functional document definition. I don't know if that's the right term. It could be a functional specification. Anyway, essentially what it is is a table where you have, or a spreadsheet, I've seen these in spreadsheets, where you have the, the, the name of the feature and a very succinct sort of um, one-liner, if you will, one paragraph that explains what the feature is. And then off of the back of that, you, you will have different uh, uh, columns that say, you know, can be tested by this, can be tested by that, needs to have this system, you know, depends on this system, that kind of stuff. It very, it's very different for different projects. But essentially, it, it is a table of all of your features from a very sort of high level point of view. And um, I have here, I've tailored it. So this feature is only available for logged in users, logged out users. Um, if it's 100% um, automatically tested, so at the moment, so if it can be 100% tested in an automated fashion from uh, unit tests all the way to acceptance tests, is it completed? So like a, a, a sort of a yes, no flag there and any, any, any particular notes. And I've been using these notes as things to sort of things that I still need to do around this particular feature. So here we go. There's actually a, quite a number of them. So I'll try and try and be as thorough, but as quick as possible. So the first one, I'm looking at the laptop here. That's why I'm not looking at the camera. The first one is, can a user register? So that's the first re uh, first feature. So user registration. Um, you need to be obviously um, logged out for that. To, in order to register, you need to be logged out. Um, it can be 100% tested. However, it's not because there are some unit tests that are um, uh, still I need to, to, to build. Uh, these unit tests are specifically around the forms. However, and this is where we're going to get into the testing thing. Uh, however, it is acceptance tested. So it has an end-to-end -end test. There's actually a number of end-to-end -end tests because it's testing the happy paths and the, and the sad paths. So one could argue that the unit tests are actually, um, there's, there's not a lot of value that those unit tests can actually give you when you actually have a Cypress test. Cypress is the framework that I'm using for end-to-end -end tests that, that registers users. Um, and you can prove that way that your tests, that, that the feature can work. There's a lot of that. There's a lot of those things. So the, the other one is, can a user log in? So, you know, after you've registered, can you log in? So obviously you need to be uh, logged out for that feature. Um, can it be 100% units, 100% uh, tested? Yes, it can, so it certainly can. Um, is it completed? No, it does require some unit tests. However, the acceptance tests are there. Okay, so the other one is, can a user log out? <laughs> so you could tell how, how sort of uh, siloed these features are. Um, again, you need to be logged in for that. 
So that's the first logged in feature. Um, it's not 100% automated yet. Um, there are some unit tests that are required, again, around Symfony forms, but it is acceptance tested. Uh, can the user reset their password from within a content manager from their, from their account? Again, um, they need to be logged in for this. Um, and they, they, it need, there needs to be a couple of tests for this. The tests here are more to do with, um, like I said, more to do with the forms rather than the acceptance tests. I have a series of tests that just do all this, these things, and I can actually see it in Chrome going through. I don't know whether I need to worry too much about these unit tests, to be honest, before, before launch. I'm actually going to skip the notes on here because there are a lot of things where it says need this test, need that test. So a lot of this is just not 100% automated. However, there is high level acceptance tests. So I'll just go through the features. So um, user can log out, user can f uh, forget password, user can reset password, user can change their name, user can see a list of enrolled courses. So when they've actually logged in, they can see their enrolled courses. User can export their data, user can delete their account. User can uh, list their invoices uh, in HTML. Uh, user can view their invoices in HTML. Then we've got a course features section. So user can watch a free video course. Uh, so watch a free course. Uh, user can watch part of a paid course and then are offered to uh, sign up. So that feature actually hasn't been developed yet. That's one thing that I, I, I still have to build from scratch. Um, user can see a privacy policy. Again, I need to actually write that uh, privacy policy. User can download course uh, project files. Um, that I still need to develop. So there are a couple of creaky corners there that I need to work through. Um, user can see a list of courses. User can view course details. User can enroll in a free course. User can purchase and enroll in a paid course. And then we've got blog sections. So user can see a list of blog posts. User can view a blog post. And I've cut down a lot of features. So before there were like users can and can comment on a feature or on a, on a, on a blog post. Um, you know, user can like and uh, add to a wish list these particular courses and stuff. I'm not going to do this in this release because that's a, there's just a lot of work there. There is a number of things that I've still got to develop. Um, most of those are about, I would say, 75% tested, the ones that are actually in play. Um, but uh, And there is a lot of acceptance tests going on, which cover a lot of these things. So I'm at this point where I'm thinking, do I actually need to do a unit test and integration test to ensure that all of these things work when I got um, acceptance tests that, in Cypress that actually prove these things. Hey, Sim, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, Sim has asked, thanks for you too. Oh, that's very kind. Thank you. Um, I started uh, listening to your podcast and watching your videos to learn object-oriented programming and just got my first junior PHP Symphony dev job back in December. Wow, congratulations, Sim. I, I, that is amazing. That's so, so nice to hear. I really appreciate that. Thank you for coming on and, and, and letting me know. If you've got any questions, any questions at all about not only PHP and Symphony and object-oriented programming, but just career advice, please let me know. I'm, I'm more than happy to, to advise and uh, guide and, and talk about my experiences. Um, I, that is such a good... That is so nice to hear that you got your job back way back in December and it's now March. So you must be, what, three, nearly nearly uh, three and a bit months through. Yeah, more than that, actually. It's March in the third month. Yeah. So, wow. Fantastic. Congratulations. Congratulations, Sim. That's uh, amazing. And also, thank you very much, uh, Wasim, for joining. That's, that's uh, nice for you to, to come on board. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So the question I have is... Do I actually need to test everything? Um, there are a lot of things here that can be 100% automatically tested. There are a few edge cases that can't, and we're going to talk about those in a second. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to happen around uh, the whole purchasing side of things. So I'm using Stripe, and uh, I've set it up at the minute so you know you can... Uh, 
uh, as a dev user, you can log in and you know you can uh, find one of these paid courses and you can purchase it and and uh, it, it then sends a, a message to the webhook and uh, you know d deals with all of that stuff when the crons are running. There's a lot of things in there. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of moving parts. And it's very difficult to test from a, an end-to-end -end point of view when you're dealing with webhooks. Webhooks are very awkward <laughs> because it's not where the diff one of the differences between an API and a webhook is the fact that um, well, an API is more of a contractual agreement between between two systems and they're talking in a, in you know they they can they can request and respond and they can just keep seamlessly doing that so forward and back forward and back communication and that's all well and good because you have a defined specification that your API needs to follow it could even be like the json spec or the you know the open api spec or something some sort of swagger spec um, that that is agreed by both parties. With a, a webhook, it's slightly different. It's more of a one-way communication, and it's the sense that Stripe is sending um, events to the system. And one of the complexities, there's a lot of complexities, but one of the complexities is that um, you cannot guarantee the order in which those events get fired. So, for example, let's say... Let's say, for example, five people purchase my course. Uh, that would be amazing if, 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 if even five people looked at my course. But let's say five people purchased the course and they all did it within the first, it, within, say, 10 minutes. You can't guarantee on your end, the, the e-com end, that, um, that, say, the third payment went through okay or the second payment um, could, may have been declined or the the last payment um, could have, you know, that could have hit some fraud detection or something, something daft like that. And you can't guarantee that all of these events are actually going to be sent to you in a, in any kind of chronological order. It's not like you know this person has purchased this, so we're not going to allow any other requests to to, to hit this webhook until that purchase has been fully fulfilled. You simply can't do that. You simply can't do that. Um, it has to be, you have to you have to wait for these events to come in you have to almost do a polling system where you're listening for these events to to fall through and it can be can um it can be quite tricky you, you i i see uh, when i compare webhooks to apis i think like webhooks is more like juggling and apis uh it's more like um you know talking through a pipe you know it's only forward and back forward and back whereas with the webhooks you're juggling all sorts of things <laughs> all sorts of events and you're having to deal with all sorts of various things another piece of complexity is that you can't if if there is um, many events that get fired because of one action you can't guarantee that those events have come in the right order as well so there's all sorts of edge cases wonderful edge cases race conditions that you have to sort of deal with and cope for and i know i guarantee that i know that once this goes live i am not going to be able to catch every single thing because i'm not even going to in my wildest dreams i'm not going to be able to think of every possible conceivable um thing that could happen with these stripe webhooks and there's a lot of them and there's a lot of them so a, a, an argument is well you shouldn't really be testing Stripe anyway. The Stripe, you should just assume works and you should only be testing your stuff. So you could mimic, you could mock your webhooks and uh, so you would mock the events that get fired and you would have those in fixtures and then you would um, run those fixtures as though it was Stripe communicating to you. So that's all well and good. You could do that. You could do that. You you then have a set sort of fixed standard st uh, state that you're always um, testing against, right? Which is always good. But in order to capture every possible conceivable edge case, you're going to need to have a lot of those things. Plus, um, there are um, multiple communication paths. So, for example, um, if I was to say if i was to create a customer on stripe that's me sending a request an api request to stripe i then have to have a uh, some webhook that 
listens to that sort of thing that comes back with the customer's ID off of Stripe. Okay, so that's that's um, that's a communication from my site to Stripe and then from Stripe to my site using a webhook. All right, and then what happens if I want to get to the next stage? So the customer's been created. Now the customer does something on my site to select the, 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 the course, right? So they've chosen the course, they've enrolled in that course, that's fine. They now have to pay for that thing. So they're, again, they're having to send a request from uh, my site to the Stripe API. And then I have to consider the various different scenarios that could happen when the user has maybe put in their wrong details, maybe their card is expired, maybe that, you know, it's hit some fraud detection thing, um, or maybe it's just timed out or something's gone wrong on, on the Stripe send. And I have to kind of mimic and mock those kind of things. So when I'm talking about an end-to-end -end test, it's very fluffy when it comes to Stripe because there are so many um, user journeys that can, you can think possibly conceive of that it's, it's going to be very, very difficult. And I know that I'm going to I'm going to have to take a call at some point and just go, you know, I, I have covered as much as I possibly can. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's weird, you know. I've done so many sites for people um, over the 20 years, and where I'm working in the uh, teams of people, and we, we, we have tests, and, you know, we're, we have a level of confidence there's always in the back of my mind that something could go horribly, horribly wrong. And in some cases it does, um, but we have, say, safety nets around those kind of scenarios. We use tools like Sentry or, or Bugsnag or um, uh, you know, Datadog or something that, that allows us some sort of monitoring visual on what's actually happening, the errors that are being thrown, the journeys that the users are making and all of that jazz. Um, the requests, the referrers, the the properties in the in the HTTP requests, and all all of those interesting things um, will help you to debug how a user has got from one state to another state, and how they've broken their broken the system. When it's just me, though, this this is my platform. This is my reputation. <laughs> <laughs> and the knowledge that I can't actually be looking at this 100% all the time because I've got other work to do, get on with. Um, like, for example, today I had a, 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 a pull request being sent on one of my packed courses. And I was just like, okay, that I need, to, I need to spend some time to look at that. It's in Python, so I need to now switch my thinking from the PHP work that I'm doing to Python. Um, and I need to help this customer out, right? This, this student out. And I just have, I, I admit that I haven't got around to it because I've just been so busy today. I've been doing other things. So that will be, that will be high on my priorities list over the weekend um, to, to do. And I just know that if there was any kind of issue with how to code well, um, during the working day, I'm going to struggle to try and do two things at once. It's impossible. You can't. You can't. You can't do two things at once. The problem with what I would with what I am trying to achieve right now is the fact that once How to Code Well does go live, and God knows when that's going to happen. It's probably gonna, not going to happen for a long, long time. When that happens, um, I'm going to have to devote a lot of time to it. So I may have to just except the fact that I need to take holiday from my contract stuff and then and, and release this and just let it stabilize for, I don't know, a couple of weeks, a couple of months maybe, where I'm just constantly here monitoring it, improving it. Because you never, ever, ever get a website launched. I've never done this. I've never had the experience of launching a website and everything is just perfectly fine. When you're dealing with e-com, when you're dealing with customers, when you're dealing with um, with with bugs and stuff, it never goes swimmingly. It never it, it never just goes up. Um, if you're dealing with like, I I mean, I'm, I'm comparing how to go well with really high traffic sites that I've been been working on or have worked on in the past. And I know that that's a really stupid comparison because this is a very small, tiny website with just a couple of videos on it, to be honest, compared to 
the e-com sites that I've done in the past with literally thousands and thousands of products and tens of thousands of requests that happen at any given point of t in time. So it's it's a really bad comparison, and I but I've always got that in the back of my mind that 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 if something was to go bad, then I am gonna have to somehow fix it during whatever time I'm whatever I'm focusing on or focused on at the time. And that's that's something that I've always wanted to avoid with my contractual work. Um, being a contractor, you have to give time to the work, obviously, that you're doing. You can't just say, oh, you know, um, you know, I, I'm going to sneak off and do do half an hour on this thing for myself when you're you, you've got a daily rate and someone's paying you a lot of money to do something else. You know, that's that's a bit naughty. So, yeah, I'm going to have to manage that. I'm going to have to manage that. But anyway, getting back to the tests. So we have, um, we used to use acceptance tests in Selenium and that was okay. Selenium is incredibly slow, incredibly slow for what we're trying to achieve here. Uh, so I moved to Cyprus and Cyprus is incredibly fast, <laughs> which is great. And you actually get a video, uh, sort of a, an output of how, um, the, the, how the users clicked on the forms that were filled out and all of that jazz. So it, it is actually really good. So you can actually see and you can replay the the journey, uh, which is really good. And because it's in JavaScript, you can see the console log. So if you've got anything, you know, JavaScripty going on, you can actually see uh, all of that stuff. And because it's a browser, you can inspect uh, the HTML elements as well. So if you're if you've called something, um, if you've done one of these selectors and you've called it something wrong, you can get into the debugger and actually see what this, what you should have done. It's really good. Hey, Wineblood. Thanks, for, man. That's uh, really kind of you. <laughs> cool. You've got a career question. Nice. Uh, da, 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 da. I've not worked coded. Uh, 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 okay. And, okay. I'll just read this. Give me a second. Oh, that is a good question. Okay, so Wineblood's question is... Okay, so Wineblood's question is regarding... It's a career question, and uh, Wineblood is saying that um, they haven't done any coding for over a year, and uh, starting a new job... Is this it? I'm assuming this new job that you're starting is in programming and would like advice on getting back into programming after a, such a long break. Whoa. Right. Okay. So this is, um, this is an interesting one. It's going to be difficult for me to answer because I've never been out of this space. Um, the longest I've been away from coding is probably about a fortnight. <laughs> <laughs> and that's only because I was on holiday. And to be honest, some of the holidays that I've been to, I've taken my laptop with me. Oh, I didn't say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> just in case things go wrong. Um, so it's that's a really difficult one for me to answer because, because I've never been away from coding. However, I could probably talk about getting back into a programming language that I haven't used in a while. Um, so I mentioned earlier about the Python thing. Um, so in my day to day, I, I'm a PHP dev, right? I, I have, I don't have any Python clients at the minute. And, and yet I have these Python courses that I've done and, and that people have, um, uh, paid for and, and, and I need to fix because there's some update that I need to deal with and, and all of this jazz. So how do I get back into that sort of space? Um, very difficult. Uh, I, I, I find it very difficult to uh, context switch and to pick up from where I've left off. I find that if I am in the zone of coding, um, I can just, it almost becomes very natural when I'm actually typing. Um, the things that are in my mind just come onto the, to the IDE very quickly, uh, which is nice. The challenge though, is when you come out of that zone and you come back to it in, in however long you, you know, you've waited for and you come back to it and it's like, 
you know, what on earth was I thinking at that time? What, where, where was my head when I was writing these variables? Um, that none of this makes any sense to me at the minute. It made sense to me back then, but it doesn't now. So I find documentation is really helpful. I also find uh, doing things, you know, sort of isolated feature branches very helpful. I've been trying to scale back what uh, my feature branches contain. So, like, let's say, for instance, we've been doing a lot of testing recently. So I have created feature branches specifically for certain types of tests or areas that I want to test in rather than have a scattergun approach of just, um, you know, a, a, a branch that's just called tests. And it could have all sorts of tests from all sorts of different things. So trying to be a little bit more specific, a bit more precise over, over how... Um, how I work, which means that when I come back to how I work, I am more aware of w how I left it. <laughs> um, one piece of advice I can give you is to take some time over it because you, you, by acknowledging that you are out of, you, you're a little bit rusty is the first win, acknowledging that. Because once you've acknowledged that, you become less stressed. Um, you've accepted the fact that uh, you need to perhaps relearn uh, re-stretch your muscle memory um, and do a little bit of upskilling here. So once you've accepted that, uh, it, it, you, you'll, you'll ease into it better. It, I find that if I get a little bit annoyed with myself, then things become more difficult for me to absorb and learn. So if I'm like, oh, I should have known this, I should have known this, you know, or I did know this, I did know this, um, then that I'm often putting up barriers for me to actually absorb that. Um, whereas if I was to laugh it off and go, yeah, yeah, you know, I won't be making that mistake again. Um, then that, that's something that I find is a positive experience rather than a, than a negative experience. And therefore I'm able to, um, to get back to where I left off fairly quickly. Um, but apologies. I can't, I haven't left for any more than about fortnight. So I can't really, say how how one would get back to that um the only thing i can say is to do it nice and gradually don't get annoyed with yourself you know and um just try and get to the point where you were having fun before um because that's that's the whole point of it right having fun with what you're doing and what you're coding um i guess i don't know the reasons why you came left programming um but um i i would like to think that you have a positive experience with code and um you want to try and get back to that sort of positivity and just accept that there's going to be a bit of struggle to, to start with i hope that kind of helped uh, a bit of a roundabout way of me saying just chill out <laughs> <laughs> and take it nice and slow um i guess depending on what it is that you're you're getting back into there may have to be a bit of t time that you have to spend to learn to relearn so reading documentation um and reading the code uh, more reading of the code than actually writing of the code so give yourself a bit of time to just read the code um without actually doing anything to it it's just so you are, you are getting into the sort of the feel of it so you're reading the functions, you're reading the methods, you're stepping through these things. You may even um, you may even run an app, your existing application um, or an application that you've you've done before with a debugger running, and you can step through. This means that you're sort of um, nostalgically remembering how things work, how things hang together. You know, um, oh, this is what the difference is between a private and a protected uh, method are. This is what the difference is between a switch statement is and a if statement or what have you. Um, this is the difference between an array and an, an object or whatever, whatever it, whatever it is that you, you're, you're looking at. So yeah, give yourself a bit of time. I hope that helped. <laughs> so these, these tests, um, we have about 600 ish, about 580, uh, unit tests that cover all sorts of different things with uh, how to code well, the, this platform. Um, and this hits around about 75%. It's, it's, it's actually now at 76.5, something like that, uh, percent co code coverage. 
And um, so I'm fairly happy with uh, with that. However, there are, as I've mentioned, there are some 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 big chunky features that I need to um, actually finish. So take that number with a pinch of salt, because because we haven't we haven't actually finished all of the features yet, um, because we have those features where I have to. Um, uh, where you say say there's there's a paid course and you've got say ten tutorials on there and I want to have a feature that says that you can watch the first four and then it, when you hit the fifth one um, you have to sort of like sign up for it um, and, and pay for the rest of them that that kind of those features that that, that hasn't been developed yet I haven't f uh, broken the back yet of the webhooks with Stripe yet because I'm still pulling my hair out on the best ways to actually test those because I want to test them as I develop uh, that kind of stuff so there are a few edge cases that I need to do to to deal with a few things things that I need to to work through so take that seventy five percent or whatever it is with a pinch of salt. I am not a fan of chasing the code coverage. Um, I'm not a massive fan of making sure everything is nice and green because in my opinion, that gives you a false sense of confidence. Um, because like I said, there are features yet to be developed. So you can't really say that 100% of your features have been tested because they're not actually being built yet. Um, and because of that, there might be changes to the existing code base based on the outcomes of those new features that are being developed, which means that some of your tests may have to change. So I'm, and also um, just because you have tested everything, uh, you got a hundred percent unit test coverage. You have mocked probably a lot of that um, to, to get your system to, to you get your calls to, to work. Um, which means that you've set assumptions and that is a bit dangerous in in uh, the application because you are you've made an assumption that the data is of this particular uh, data type or have this particular values so um, you have to be very sort of careful with the fact that 100% doesn't mean that 100% of all the things have actually been tested 100% of what you um, have defined has been tested, but not a hundred percent of the whole possibilities has been tested. And this is where, uh, mutation testing comes in. So I have, um, started doing a bit of infection testing. So, uh, using infection.io and this is something that we haven't done on stream before. Uh, I was playing around with this a couple of evenings ago. In fact, when I was at, um, uh, I forget the name of it, PHP UK, um, when was that? Last month? Yeah, last month. Um, when I was at PHP UK, when I was in the hotel, I was actually running infection, um, because I couldn't sleep. So I was, <laughs> I was testing my, my application, how to code well.net, um, when I got back from the conference. Uh, and of, obviously I was doing that on the train on the way back as well, uh, for part of it at least, and the tra train on the way up there. So infection is really good. Um, let's talk about that. So infection is a way of, um, writing these mutation tests, which physically alter the code before it gets tested. So if you have like, a, um, I'm going to totally blow this apart. I really should probably spend a, an actual podcast talking about infection just solely because it's so cool. Um, but let's say, for instance, you have a method and the method has a, a bunch of parameters in there. And one of those parameters is um, it, it says that the default is true, for instance. Well, it will manually physically alter that signature. So it's the opposite. And then it will run the test and it will see if you have covered that scenario. Um, so it's a great way of, of checking the scenarios of your application, the paths of your application. Um, it's also really interesting to find dead code as well, uh, because there are certain checks that I've created in the, in the, in the platform that, um, I've, I haven't really needed to be honest. So, so it was a good good, uh, practice for me to run the infection and see what areas that I could actually trim down or refactor, um, and, and alter. And it makes sure that, that your tests that you've created are actually doing the the thing that you expect them to do. Um, I ran infection with a f sort of a very smug, um, face on, 
and I ran it and I was like, yeah, it's not going to find anything because my tests are brilliant. Um, and it found so many, so many of these um, mutants. And it gives you an output where it says that a, a mutant was killed or a mutant had escaped. And an escaped mutant is a bad mutant because it's an, a mutant that has actually, you know, your, your hasn't been covered by your tests because they've altered the code and uh, allowed this mutant f through. Uh, so it's about, like, have you tested the happy path as well as the unhappy path? A lot of people will just test the happy path and um, that will give you nice green code coverage because you've just done the thing that that uh, you've de you've defined the test in the way that it should that you assume it should be tested. And then infection comes along and says, ah, 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 we're going to change the properties here. We're going to instead of you passing in a true value, we're going to pass in a false value or, you know, instead of a one, we're going to give it a two as a as an integer or maybe we're going to change the integer to a float how is your application going to cope with all of this <laughs> and if the test still passes um then that's all well and good but if the test doesn't then you've got issues then you've got issues ah so bernard's asking can i um share my oop course yes i certainly can um i will do so i will do so um i'll i don't have the link i need to have a place of links really don't i i need to have some sort of linky link thing uh link tree not link tree that's awful Ugh. no i need some table of links that i can give out in 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 a in a show like this if you go to how to if you go to the youtube thing and then the youtube thing the platform youtube and search for um Peter Fisher, OOP, uh, full course. You can you can see it there. Uh, but I will put a link in the show notes um, for you. I'll put in, a, in some notes here. So OOP, uh, link, show notes. Right, I will do that after, after the show. So we've talked about acceptance tests. We've talked about, um, we've, we've talked about webhooks. I wasn't going to talk about webhooks today, but we've done it anyway. Um, we've talked about, uh, unit tests. What about things like functional tests and integration tests? How have I played with those? So, um, w the unit tests are great because they will test um, all of the, the the units of work individually um, in a very small sort of you know input output process type scenario thing. But when we're actually hitting things like the database or when we're hitting controllers, then we really need to. Um, have to um, we we need a little bit of scaffolding around the database because we want to be testing from a, a very sort of uh, static um, our tests need to be repeatable and it's very difficult to do that in a database unless you rebuild the database for every test which I'm doing in the integration tests so I use um, a tool called uh, Codeception for my PHP tests and PA Codeception has some really great modules that can, you, can, you can enable for uh, interacting with the database, one of which is to rebuild the database um, before each of the tests, which means that you're rebuilding it back to a given state, um, which means that your tests are therefore repeatable. And that's really, really good. Um, so I've been doing that with integration tests around things like um, the repository uh, the doctrine repository uh, calls to the database, uh, anything in terms of inserting stuff into the database or e editing anything, any records, anything like that. That's all, in my opinion, integration tests. And then we or could class it functional tests, I suppose. Um, and then you have uh, the console commands. So these are the commands that uh, listen to the webhooks and deal with those. And also I have other console commands that do other various things like um, pull in the blog posts and there's one that uh, is used for anonymizing users. That's going to be used in one of the features that I need to do for GDPR. Oh gosh, GDPR, yum, 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 yum. Um, yuck, I mean. Uh, where was I going? Uh, and then, yeah, there's other console scripts that I've got and this is having to run the scripts and then wait for the output to return. That is integration. And uh, you, once the script is ran, 
you then check the database and make sure that the state has changed to the given given state that you expect. Uh, so Codeception has some really interesting, um, really helpful uh, methods to inspect the database um, and inspect the models and stuff and see how things have changed, how your how your entities have have been manipulated uh, after the test has been given, and then you rebuild the the database back to a given state or you you insert fixtures or what have you to bring it back to where it should be. So then you can repeat the test again and again and again. Now that's all well and good when you're testing for your own code, right? Your own application and your own database schema, but it's a different story when you're dealing with, um, when you're dealing with a third party such as Stripe or AWS, for instance, um, where you're sending a request and you're having to wait for a response. And you, the the way I've done this is to mock the responses back, but they're only as good, going to be as good as the mocked response. So, for instance, if, if Stripe or AWS was to change their uh, responses, then my, um, my mocks will be out of sync. So I will be testing code that I expect will work. But then when I actually push this live, there'll be a bit of failure because I would need to uh, that they'll be they'll be coming back with different versions of stuff. Perhaps there's there's always that challenge. There's always that sort of issue, which is why SDKs are so cool, um, because the SDK will give you the actual response object that you could deal with. So when, for instance, if I was to do a composer update and I found an update um, of one of the of the AWS SDK package or the Stripe package, then I would certainly run all of the tests that relate to those um, from an integration point of view and then maybe even the acceptance point of view to ensure that, and obviously units, obviously, to ensure that um, that the, I guess, quote unquote, the regression um, of the stuff that, that I, I already know should work, still works with those changes with those updates. Um, but it's always it's always a bit of a tug of war when you're dealing with a third party because you don't know when they're going to change their code and, and you don't know how they've changed their code until you really read the release notes. Um, and you just hope that any change that they make goes uh, has uh, been properly tagged and released, which means that you can still work on the previous version and then test the new version out in the wild. I've recently been doing not that I'm the, I'm going to get into it into the weeds of it, but I've been recently doing some work where a particular package has um, or of some third party has uh, been updated when uh, a, a, a only in a dev, sort of a dev state, which means that that there hasn't actually been a physical tag with a, a minor version bump, and so there's been a challenge as to work out if the current version that we have now is the same version as what they have in the wild um, and trying to trying to deal with checksums and, and, and git commits and all of that jazz and and reading through history of, of of the git logs and all of that jazz to know when we actually created the thing and when they updated the thing and then seeing if the patches that we already have on that thing apply. I'm not going to get into it, but it's um, it's always fun when people don't use proper versioning. <laughs> ah. um, no, that PHP OOP course is free. Um, what I what I did was I created the course um, as a series of tutorials, and then. Afterwards, I stuck all the tutorials together as one big course, um, and that's free. And I, I can't remember. It's a couple of hours long, the whole thing. Um, and I really enjoy doing those kind of things because some people like to watch things from start to finish and just get a sense of, you know, they, they, they'll they see, okay, this is two hours, so this is going to take two hours of my day. And actually, they, they probably watch it on sort of like double speed, to be honest. Um and with those, I've put in timestamps around each of the tutorials within the course as well. So you can either watch the individual tutorials or you can watch the course and skip to the tutorial. Um, yeah. So really, that's all I want to talk about in regarding testing and how, where how to code well is at the minute. 
There's a lot of stuff to do. I'm going to go through the um, that table of things because th this is the stuff that I'm currently going to be working on on the t on the Twitch streams. Um, so there's going to be a load a load of testing coming up. There's going to be a load of testing, but the the, the key features that I need to build um, at the minute are. Um, just having a look at the notes. Yes, having the having the ability to lock courses at a given tutorial to say, you know, in order to watch any more of these tutorials, you need to actually enroll or sign up or or, or pay or do something. Um, so lock uh, lock the tutorials at say tutorial number five or what have you. Um, I need to do an um, a delete section so i need to have the ability for a user who's signed up to actually delete their account so this is a gdpr requirement to, it's the right to be forgotten and the way that i'm going to i need to still read the fine print on all of this stuff but one of the ways that i'm considering to do is to have this anonymous uh script that i I'll, that i will run which will remove all the sort of the personal information about the user and then just have that as a sort of a dummy record that is inactive so you can't log in it will wipe your email address your your username uh, your password so it will be just a dead account essentially um and uh it will still have say the connections in terms of the foreign keys uh, to the courses that were enrolled but because that data isn't actually personal uh, to the user, I think I can. I can do. I think I can do that. I need again. I need to look at the small print there. But um, the one of the difficulties with the GDPR requirements is that when you're having to remove uh, user data, you have to then have to rewire all sorts of stuff. So if you can get away with anonymizing that data, removing the data, so the usernames are different, the passwords are different, or non-existent. Um, so the user is not enabled you still have historic information to see how many courses were purchased that month you know um or enrolled in that month because you haven't actually deleted the historic information uh you put that account into a particular state so i've got to do a little bit of reading there and see if that is a, a thing if not it will be a complete um, deletion of everything related to that user. Um, I've built the exporting so a user can, um, so this is the right to share data, so, or export data, uh, another GDPR requirement. So there is a section on the, um, when you log in, where you can download your account. And when you download your account, you get a JSON response of your information, not your sensitive information, not like your passwords or anything, obviously, because I don't even know what they are because that's encoded and hashed. Um, but in terms of like your 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 first name, your last name, all the courses that you've enrolled in and all that jazz, um, that was another GDPR requirement. Oh, GDPR is just so, such a pain in my ass. Um, and then uh, I, the invoices, um, there is, this has already been developed, but I need to sort of tidy it up a little bit. And, I, I, and eventually I want this to be downloadable. So you would download PDFs of your invoices. Um, in the first release, though, it's just going to be viewing those as HTML documents, uh, which then you can do a, a control P and print th them. Um, so we'll have a little print button. Uh, so that needs to be developed, but I don't think that's that's difficult. The privacy policy, again, th that is something that I'm going to do right at the end because I need to, and the terms of, terms of, of service, I'm going to do those right at the end because I, I want to go through um, the features and see what it is that um, uh, I need to add, document when doing all of that jazz. So again, another GDPR requirement. Uh, <laughs> and then obviously finishing off the webhooks, which is going to take ages around the whole Stripe integration. So there's a lot of stuff that still needs to be developed. Um, but I want to get to a point where I can say that a lot of the existing stuff is 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 done and finished. Um, a lot of these things in the notes they say that they need unit testing. I need to take a stance as to whether or not that is the case, uh, because the acceptance tests are there. Um, also, there are some DevOpsy stuff that I need to do. This is also going to take a while. Um, so I need to build a, a sort of a staging pre-prod sort of environment. And then after that, there is the whole 
creation of content. So uh, I need to go through all of the 16 courses that I have and actually fill out the course details. So we have in the CMS, something that I've recently developed is um, the ability to add learning outcomes to a course and course requirements. So things that you, you're required to know in order to take the course on. Um, and uh, and the the other one, the learning outcome. What 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 is expected for you? What is it? What should you expect to learn in the course? Um, so that's done. But I haven't I haven't updated the front end to reflect those changes that are coming back from the CMS. So it's still a little bit creaky um, in places that I need to deal with. And then of course after that I need to actually look at the whole UI. And there's a lot of issues regarding the um, uh, mobile responsiveness. Uh, that I need to look at and, and deal with and, and tidy up. And you'll see all this if you watch the streams on, on, on Sunday, uh, Sunday or Saturday. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's all fun. It's all good fun. Um, I, the, recently, I haven't been streaming constantly on, on the weekends because I've been seeing seeing family. Uh, so if you're interested in watching me do any of this stuff, then please do uh um, follow me on Twitter because that's probably the best place to find out when I'm actually going to be on stream next. Um, and I, I, I normally post things out sort of at the end of the week, whether I'm going to be on, on uh, stream on the weekends. So yeah, follow at how to code well on Twitter for that. But anyway, thank you ever so much for watching. Thank you very much, um, Sim, for that lovely, uh, lovely message. I'm uh, good luck, best of luck in in your in the future as a, a Symphony PHP developer. It's lovely to to hear another dev um, in that space. And uh, thank you very much for watching that course. That's great. If you've got any feedback, as I've mentioned, then please do let me know. Anybody, if anybody's got any feedback, then please do let me know in the comments or on Discord, howtocowell.net forward slash Discord. Uh, join and there's a suggestions channel there. And I'm, I'm more than happy to take suggestions on and maybe talk about a couple of things live here on the podcast. If I don't speak to you beforehand, have a fantastic uh, weekend. Happy coding, everybody. And I'll see you again soon. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.